Good morning. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Scientific Integrity Workshop Series as part of the Global Week at UVA. Today's discussion topic is undue foreign influence in research. Before we discuss uh, the specific topic of undue foreign influence, I want to provide a broader context and some definitions. Simply put, integrity is the trait of doing the right thing under all circumstances so that your word, work, and actions can be trusted and can be acted on. Scientific integrity is adhering to the moral and ethical principles encoded in a set of standards guiding scientific research and embedded into institutional policies and procedures. The integrity of the research enterprise rests upon these core principles and values. Adhering to scientific integrity standards at all times will result in trustworthy research discoveries and outcomes that are objective, reproducible, and help humanity advance towards a state of better understanding of nature and devise better solutions to its complex problems. In recent years, we have seen increasing attacks on the accuracy of data and val validity of scientific conclusions in order to promote a variety of uh, societal, uh, social, political, and religious positions that are not scientifically supported. These attacks coupled with a general lack of scientific literacy have served to undermine public trust in science and scientists. It is through scientific integrity that we will be, we will be able to regain the trust of the people. Scientific integrity is an American value. While scientific integrity is a broad topic that involves understanding plagiarism, falsification of data, rigor and reproducibility, objectivity and transparency, ethical treatment of human subjects and animals in research, conflict of interest, a healthy and just research workplace, and much more that we will address over a series of webinars uh, in the future. Our first webinar today is focused on uh, undue uh, foreign influence on research. As an academic research institution, we recognize and celebrate international collaborations and value foreign contributions towards the success of the US research enterprise. Foreign students, postdocs, visiting scholars, and others are critical to the health of our research enterprise at home. Attracting the best and the brightest uh, from around the world has been and will continue to be uh, critical to the ongoing success of our research enterprise. However, some individuals and foreign governments violate core principles of integrity and pose risks to our research security. Hidden diversions of intellectual property uh, weaken the US innovation base and threaten our security and economic competitiveness. The US government is taking deliberate steps to address risks to research security and integrity while maintaining an open and collaborative enterprise. We are all in this together. To kick this off, we will hear from our distinguished speakers from two of the agencies that our research depends on, namely the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. We are honored to have Dr. Michael Lauer, Deputy Director of Extramural Research, NIH, and Dr. Rebecca Kaiser, Chief of Research Security Strategy and Policy at National Science Foundation. They will discuss the US government concerns about the impact of undue foreign influence, share ongoing initiatives and activities at each, each of the agencies to prevent and uh, detect and prevent these, uh, uh, these uh, scenarios, provide you with specific actions you can take to safeguard yourself, your team and your research. Uh, before I introduce our first speaker, a bit of logistics, please ask your questions through the Q&A box we will try and answer what we can in the time available and get to the questions after the webinar and post the answers in, uh, in an appropriate website that we have uh, for, for our uh, scientific integrity series. I also want to say that if you have very UVA specific questions, we do have a town hall at 11, uh, uh, starting at uh, 11 a.m. Uh, and that there will be a panel of experts um, uh, available to answer UVA specific questions. What are we doing uh, about uh, this question and even broader, in a broader context? So that's all there is uh, to the logistics. And with that, uh, I want to introduce our first uh, speaker, Dr. Michael Lauer, Mike. Uh, uh, Dr. Lauer is the Deputy Director uh, for Extramural Research at the National Institutes of Health. 
where he serves as the principal scientific leader and advisor to the director of the NIH on all matters uh, relating to the sub uh, substance quality and effectiveness of the NIH extramural research program and, and administration. Uh, he received education and training at Rensselaer uh, Polytechnic Institute, Albany Medical College, Harvard Medical School, Harvard School of Public Health, and the NHLBI's uh, Framingham Heart Study. He spent 14 years at Cleveland Clinic as a professor of medicine, epidemiology, and biostatistics. From 2007 to 2015, he served as a division director at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, where he promoted efforts to leverage big data infrastructure to enable high efficiency population and clinical uh, research efforts uh, to adopt a research funding culture that reflected data-driven policy. With that uh, introduction, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Lauer to um, uh, share his uh, um, uh, wisdom, thoughts, wisdom, observations uh, with, with us. Uh, we're fortunate to have you, Mike. Thank you, Ron, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here uh, today. This is a very important topic that we're talking about. So we'll get the slides. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and next, just keep hitting until they're all there. And one more and one more. Okay, so uh, Ram very nicely started by talking about what integrity is. Uh, these are some headlines showing some examples of what integrity uh, is not. Uh, on the left, Florida Center, this was the Moffitt Cancer Center, fired scientists because they had employment contracts uh, with uh, the Chinese government that were not known uh, to Moffitt uh, or to uh, anybody else. Uh, the University of Florida uh, encountered a similar problem. Uh, you may have heard earlier this year that the chairman of the Harvard Chemistry Department was um, charged with uh, allegedly uh, lying to the Department of Defense and to the NIH um, about his ties to China. And then more recently, he has been charged with allegedly filling out false tax forms uh, because uh, he uh, allegedly failed to report $50,000 a month of income that he received from his uh, Chinese uh, connections. And then the one on the bottom, I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail uh, later about a professor at, at Emory uh, who was uh, charged and then later on uh, pleaded guilty uh, to, um, uh, 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 to a variety of offenses related to his links with the Thousand Talents program. So these just as some examples, uh, and I'm going to uh, talk about some of these in a bit more detail and about what this is all about. Next. So there are three major problems uh, that we have seen. Uh, one is undisclosed research support. So this is where scientists um, have foreign employment uh, or, uh, or foreign grants from other agencies, and they have not, uh, as required, reported that to their home institution uh, or to the NIH. Uh, the second are, uh, is undisclosed conflict of interest. This is probably an easier one to understand since the concept of conflict of interest is not uh, new, and I'll show you an example of that. And the third are egregious violations of peer review rules. Next. So we're going to start by talking about undisclosed uh, research support, and this often comes in the form of what we call shadow uh, laboratories, and I'll explain what that is. Next. In January of 2018, Nature uh, uh, covered this, uh, ran this story called What is China's Thousand Talents Plan? The nation's bid to lure expat, expat scientists and recruit highly skilled foreign researchers uh, is now in its 10th year. This was a highly complimentary article and it suggested that for some scientists, the Thousand Talents Plan might be a way to obtain support for funding. But this is not a typical type of, of funding program uh, it is a recruitment program. Next. So in the, that article, it points out that in order to get a talents award, you have to have employment with a Chinese institution. And your, uh, your attempt to achieve such an award or to secure such an award would go through your Chinese university employer. So I'm going to assume that uh, all or nearly all of you uh, work for the University of Virginia and consider the University of Virginia to be your employer. And if you're doing your research, say through NSF or through NIH, uh, that uh, the, the whole process, the application and the award goes to the University of Virginia. Now, what we're talking about here is where a scientist would be employed here in the United States but they are um, obtaining an award through a Chinese university employer that the American employer might not even know about. 
I will show you examples of that later. Next. So the main problem here, uh, from our point of view, is the failure to uh, disclose. This is a report that was put out by the Hoover Foundation initially in uh, 2018, and then there have been updates more recently. Uh, it says that China's most systematic channel for identifying foreign-based non-traditional collectors is the Thousand Talents program. I'm going to talk about what a non-traditional collector is in a bit. But the point here is, is that they're recruiting outstanding scientists. And in most cases, uh, these scientists do not disclose receiving Thousand Talents program money to their employer. Now, for a U.S. government employee, that's absolutely illegal. Rebecca and I both work for the U.S. government. We're not allowed to work for anybody else um, except under, uh, under uh, certain circumstances. And this is also true for uh, corporate personnel. And in many academic institutions, this is true as well. You're not allowed to work for an outside employer unless you have gone through some kind of pre-approval uh, process. And what has happened here is that that doesn't happen. Next. So let me uh, walk through uh, how this works, and then I'm going to show you some real examples. So an obvious question is, what is a recruitment? And hopefully as you listen to this, uh, what will be going through your head is that this is extremely obvious. So let's imagine a simple world. There are two American universities, uh, two universities in the world, an American university, uh, it might be the University of Virginia, and a Chinese university. And each university has an academic leader, that might be their dean, uh, and uh, there is one uh, scientist who's on the bottom. Okay, next. So now this uh, Chinese academic leader sees this American scientist and says, I would like this American scientist to come work for my institution. And so uh, what they do is they attempt to recruit this person, which is, of course, absolutely fine. Next. And now this person has moved to the Chinese university. Now, this is an absolutely perfectly fine, acceptable form of recruitment. Um, and hopefully what's also obvious here is that the American academic leader now knows that they no longer have this scientist. The scientist no longer works at the American university. And therefore, the American academic leader is not going to be submitting a grant application to the government identifying this person as a principal investigator. Now, hopefully all of that was completely obvious. Okay, next. So now what I'm going to show you is how it works with a talents award. So this is an example of an application uh, for a, a thousand talents award. Um, and this is filled out. The applicant is a, an American scientist, in this case, well-funded by the NIH. The employer is not their American university. The employer is their Chinese institution um, that's located in a specific Chinese province. So these applications are quite long. Um, they, in some respects, look like an NIH or NSF application. Um, and let's say that the application, it goes through a review process and it, it looks good. Next. So the person will then receive something like this, um, which you could think of as being something equivalent to a just-in-time request uh, from uh, NIH. Uh, it says to uh, this person, so this particular person is, again, a well-funded NIH, uh, NIH-funded investigator. Um, this has been reviewed, and you are shortlisted in a certain batch of the National Thousand Talents Program. Uh, you will enjoy corresponding working and living benefits, and you will receive a certain amount of financial support after you have performed the work contract. Now, a critical point to this document is what's on the top. It's, it says the Organization Department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China. This is a political program. It is run out of the Chinese Communist Party, and, and there, there is significance uh, to that. Now, the other key part here is the word contract. There is a formal contract uh, between the scientist uh, and the Chinese institution. Next. So here's an example of, uh, of one of these contracts. We have seen dozens of these contracts. We've probably seen over 100 by now. Um, and so here's an example. This is a contract with uh, a, a Chinese institution called the Chinese Academy of Sciences. There's an employer, uh, and that's so-called Party A. And then Party B is the employee. And, and Party B is an American scientist who works at an American institution, um, but in this case is now contracted to work for uh, this institution in China. There is a provision at the top that says party A employs party B as a professor in the Thousand Talents program for a period of five years. Party B shall work full time at party A as a professor. Now think about this. How can you work full time 
at a Chinese university if you're also working full time at an American university. That is a problem. Um, then uh, these contracts go on for many pages, but here's another interesting provision, which is that one of the objectives is that the laboratory in the United States will be gradually moved back to China. The whole idea of this is that this lab will now move uh, to China, but it's not moving in a, in a, a, as a kind of clean recruitment, as we saw before, uh, but rather um, in, a, in a stealth uh, way. Next. The contracts uh, include provisions and also include um, expected deliverables. So this is a, a different contract. And in this, in this case, the, uh, um, the American scientist is being given a research fund of 8 million RMB, which is about $1.2 million. Uh, by the way, this particular scientist was also very well funded by NIH. Uh, and we did not know about this $1.2 million that was being provided to this researcher uh, to support his research. And by the way, neither did his American institution. On the bottom, there is a description of some expected provisions, um, and, um, uh, pro expected outputs. In this case, one of the expected outputs is that there will be two to three domestic patents, meaning patents uh, in China. So there's an expectation uh, that this work will generate IP. And often the IP that is generated is closely linked to NIH funded work but NIH doesn't know about it and neither does the uh, home institution. Next. All right, so remember, here's what a clean recruitment looks like. Next. And ag again. All right, so now this is what a thousand talents recruitment looks like. In this case, the scientist has a formal contractual relationship with the Chinese institution but at the same time, they continue to maintain their relationship with the American university without the American academic leader knowing about it. And so what this means is, is that effectively the Chinese university is inside uh, the American lab. They, they, they have set up a, um, a perhaps a duplicate or replicate of the lab in China, and they know exactly what's going on um, in the American lab because the person who's running the lab is also working uh, for them. Uh, the key thing here is that the American academic leader doesn't know about this. Next. So here's an example. This demonstrates that the American institution is unaware of what's going on. This is an email that comes from an institutional president to a member of their faculty. And it says, Dear Dr. X, we were unaware of these additional funding sources until the communication from Dr. Lauer at NIH. We have obtained translations of these applications and contracts. Regarding the Thousand Talents program, you indicated that this was an honor program comparable to an academic title. It is clear from the contract that this program includes provision of space, staff, and funds for laboratory research and expected research deliverables. There are two key points here about this remarkable email. One is that the American institutional American institution knew nothing about what was going on. Uh, the president of this institution did not know that uh, that their supposedly full-time faculty also had a full-time job in China. The the second issue here is that the American um, uh, scientist told a lie um, because what what the scientist said. Uh, was that the Thousand Talents program is nothing. It's just an honors program. Well, it's not. It's not an honors program. It's a recruitment program with real money, real space, and, and real contractual uh, obligations. And that has been a common theme of what, of what we have seen. It's not only non-disclosure, uh, which is serious enough, but it's also uh, deeply uh, embedded lies. Next. All right, so in summary, we, we have seen a number of these foreign uh, employment agreements. Uh, there is often a, there's a time commitment, sometimes it's full-time, sometimes it's part-time. There's a substantial funding for uh, research, which can be in the hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. They get provided with a laboratory, equipment, and personnel for uh, free. Um, there's uh, a salary. They often get a housing um, uh, bonus, uh, it's typically about $75,000 a year. But uh, in exchange for that, they're expected uh, to produce deliverables. They are expected to produce uh, papers that appear in high impact uh, journals. They're expected, they may be expected to produce patents. They may be expected to bring certain scientists to the United States for training in their American lab, unbeknownst uh, to the American institution. And uh, these create obvious conflicts of commitment and, and uh, interest. There are only 12 months in the year. You can't be working 24 months uh, of the year. Okay, next. 
There are uh, some significant uh, implications of this. Um, you may remember I mentioned the Emory case. This was a Xiaojiang Li. Uh, he was a tenured professor at Emory. He uh, claimed that he was spending 100% of his time uh, at Emory, and that's what he told them. But in fact, uh, he had jobs, uh, contractual uh, jobs in China uh, with at least two um, different institutions. And while he was in China, running a lab in China, he made uh, at least $500,000 of income that was not disclosed, personal income, that was not disclosed to, uh, his, uh, to Emory. It wasn't disclosed to NIH. And it also wasn't disclosed to the IRS. And so he wound up pleading guilty uh, for filing uh, false uh, tax returns. Next. All right, now, when you get a job at a university, one of the opportunities you have is to write grants. And that's no different in China than it is here in the United States. Uh, so uh, he, um, scientists can uh, write uh, grants uh, like this one. So this is a, um, a proposal to the National Natural Science Foundation of China. This is what the cover page looks like. Uh, these proposals can go on for 50 or 70 pages. Um, there's forums and there's a description uh, of the science. Next. Uh, so this is from uh, one of the scientists funded by uh, NIH. This person was very well funded. There's a table that appears in these, these grant applications uh, that describes the project team. So in this particular case, line one uh, was this uh, American scientist who was a PI on multiple NIH grants. He was also the PI on this Chinese grant. And in the column on the right, he indicates that he's going to spend 10 months per year uh, working on this grant. So if he's spending 10 months per year working on this grant, he doesn't have seven months per year to be working uh, on uh, NIH grants. So that this is a case, a case of clear conflict of commitment. Uh, next. Uh, next, and again, just keep clicking. Good, okay. So uh, another problem that we have seen is that uh, sometimes uh, scientists will take an American grant, they'll translate it into Chinese and submit it to a Chinese granting agency and get the Chinese granting agency to fund essentially the same thing. We've also seen the opposite where the grant is originally in Chinese and then it gets translated into English and gets submitted to the NIH. So we have had uh, quite a few cases now of this. We have received millions of dollars uh, of, of refunds uh, because we were funding grants that were identical or highly similar to Chinese grants. And the investigators are essentially double dipping. They're getting funded twice to do the same work uh, and they're not disclosing this. Next. Uh, and this has uh, significant implications. Uh, this was a, a case at the Van Andel Research Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, where two of their scientists failed to disclose uh, grants that they had in China. They did not disclose this to NIH. This led to a $5.5 million false claim settlement uh, with the Department of Justice. So this failure uh, to, uh, to disclose research support um, has uh, serious uh, implications, which can be civil, can be criminal, uh, and certainly are compliance. Next. All right, so that's uh, that's the uh, um, the, uh, sh the shadow labs, the undisclosed employment and grants. Next, I want to talk about undisclosed financial conflicts of interest, and this should be easier to understand. Next, so here's a case involving a scientist named Kang Zhang. Uh, he was a tenured professor at the University of California, San Diego, uh, and unbeknownst to UCSD, he and his wife had a company that was worth $11.7 million that was based in China. Uh, this company was developing uh, technologies for eye and genetic uh, research, uh, and in 2017 had a value of $11.7 million. According to the Chinese report, uh, he had 49% equity and his wife had 25% equity, so between the two of them, uh, they essentially uh, owned this company, and none of this was disclosed. It wasn't disclosed to UCSD, and it wasn't disclosed to NIH. So this is a serious uh, failure to disclose um, a substantial financial conflict of interest. Next. And uh, here's an example of a paper that they published um, in which uh, they were both authors. Uh, the wife identified herself as being affiliated with the company. Uh, the husband, even though he had 50% uh, equity, did not mentioned the affiliation at all. And he identified his primary affiliation as Sichuan University. And they say that they had no competing financial interests. And this pattern was repeated uh, at least 10, 10 times. This wasn't an, an accidental uh, omission. Next. Finally, I want to talk about peer review breaches, uh, the third kind of problem we've seen. Next. 
This is a case from MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center where uh, a well-funded uh, scientist there was serving in one of our study sections. Uh, and what he did was he took uh, confidential applications that he had perfectly legitimate access to and he emailed them to China. Uh, and he knew that he, what he was doing wasn't quite right because he said things like keep, keep, keep it to yourself or keep this confidential. Uh, but he would uh, also tell his uh, Chinese compatriot, uh, his, his Chinese um, uh, scientist, he would say, you know, here is bone and meat that you need. Oh, here are some methods you, you may learn from this uh, proposal. This is obviously an egregious violation of, of our peer review uh, integrity rules. Next. We have uh, identified uh, at least 200 scientists um, who are, uh, may have problems that are serious enough that we have contacted institutions. We have contacted 92 institutions around the United States about these 200 scientists. We have quite a few more uh, to go. Uh, it involves many fields of biomedicine all over the United States, although nearly all of them are involved in some form of uh, preclinical research. Uh, what's remarkable are the, uh, the lies uh, that we've encountered. I, I showed you a, a, a couple of them before. Uh, we've heard lies like, uh, yes, it's true, my name was a, a, is listed as a PI on a Chinese grant, but I, I actually never wrote that grant. I just allowed somebody else to put my name down as the PI, even though I wasn't involved. And I allowed somebody to use my name because I'm famous and they're not. Uh, another is that I knew nothing about this grant, even though the grant was actually later on found on their computer files. Um, and they helped write it. Um, another is I didn't actually do the work. You know, yes, it's true. I had a contract in China. Yes, it's true. I was serving as a PI on a Chinese grant, but I didn't do the work. And therefore, you, you know, why is NIH so upset? Uh, and then another type of lie we've seen is where they'll say, uh, yes, it's true that in the papers, I listed a Chinese university as, as, as my affiliation. And I did that multiple times, but that was a mistake. I, I mistakenly identified somebody else as my employer. Next. There's been a lot of activity in this area. The, uh, about a year ago, uh, the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations uh, posted a report uh, on the Thousand Talents Program, and Dr. Kaiser and I had the opportunity to testify uh, together at a hearing about this. Uh, next is a report that came out from the, uh, from the Jason. This is a report that was uh, commissioned by, uh, by, uh, by NSF. Um, Dr. Kaiser may talk about this. And then on the right, um, is a letter that was uh, sent out uh, to the U.S. research community uh, a little over a year ago from Kelvin Drogemeyer, uh, who uh, is the director of the Office of OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Next. Let, let me end um, by quoting from a, a website. Uh, this is from the Penn State University website that I really think says it all. Um, none of what I've been talking about um, deals with collaborations. Uh, having a secret offshore bank account or a secret employment agreement or double dipping or grant applications or failing to disclose a $12 million company in China uh, or, uh, or emailing confidential grant applications to China, none of those are collaborations. Those are examples of breaches of integrity. Um, Collaboration is a very good thing. And, and uh, so here's what it says at Penn State. While most international collaborations are acceptable and encouraged, we urge researchers to err on the side of transparency. It protects everybody's interest, uh, the federal government, Penn State, individual researchers, and their international collaborators to have international relations relationships disclosed and vetted to determine if there are any potential conflicts of commitment, duplications of research, and or diversion of intellectual property in the performance of federally funded research. We have seen every single one of these uh, because of failure uh, of the, on the part of the scientists to disclose and, vet, uh, disclose and have vetted um, their foreign relationships and their foreign affiliations uh, with their uh, local universities. Next. Uh, let me just uh, conclude by saying that uh, this is not uh, just an NIH issue. This is uh, a national issue. Um, it involves many parts of government, uh, including the, um, the NSF. Uh, I have had the privilege of working with many people um, at the FBI, the Department of Justice, National Intelligence, DHHS, the Department of State, OSTP, DO, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, a number of non-federal uh, organizations, as well as dozens of VPRs and institutional compliance and integrity leaders. Um, this is a team effort. In fact, it's really an international team effort um, as we learn more about the nature of the, of the threats that we are facing. And so with that, I, I will conclude. 
And I want to thank you again very much for the opportunity uh, to, uh, to meet with you today. Mike, thank you very much for that, uh, that wonderful comprehensive view of what the, what the problem is and the, and the evidence is. I'm, I'm sure um, uh, the, the audience have a full sense of uh, what, what the agency is talking about. Um, now, uh, personally, as a, a tour, tour NSFR myself, it is my pleasure to introduce our second distinguished speaker, Dr. Uh, Rebecca Kayser. Uh, and she's gonna be sharing uh, with us uh, the NSF uh, view, point of view, and 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 and, and uh, maybe some uh, advice uh, to all of us on how to go about this. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kaiser is the head of the Office of International Science and uh, Engineering, and and the chief research security strategy and policy um, uh, at the uh, National Science Foundation. Um, uh, Dr. Kaiser served as uh, the head of OASC since coming to NSF in 2015. This office uh, promotes an integrated international strategy and manages uh, internally focused programs that are innovative, uh, catalytic, and responsive to a broad range of NSF and national interests. Uh, Dr. Kaiser is the first COR SSP, a position established in March 2020 to ensure the security of federally funded research while maintaining uh, open international collaboration. That is. Uh, that is, that is the question that's in the minds of uh, people here, and you are the best person who, who have seen this, this issue both ways, and uh, we're excited to uh, you know, have you here. Uh, she also led NSF efforts to develop and implement efforts to improve research security and, and the agency coordination with other federal agencies and the, and the White House. Prior to NSF, uh, she was a special advisor to the Na National Aeronautics and Space Administration uh, administrator and an executive in residence at the American uh, University. She has held several positions uh, within NASA. Uh, Dr. Kaiser also served as assistant to the director for international relations at the White House Office of Science Technology Policy. So she really touches all the bases um, and uh, where she provided policy guidance uh, to the president's uh, science advisor. Her experience covers uh, science and technology policy agreements and other cooperative efforts. She's a board member of uh, Women in Aerospace and a member of the American Academy of the Advancement of Science. She has a bachelor's degree in Japanese studies uh, from uh, Wellesley College, master's degree in uh, politics uh, of the world economy from London School of Economics, and a doctorate in international studies from the University of South Carolina. She speaks Japanese and English. I'm sure she's gonna be talking to us in English. I have a feeling about that. Uh, Rebecca? Thank you very much, Ram, and ohayo gozaimasu. That'll be the only Japanese that I, that I speak today, I promise. Um, you see, in my background, I have uh, the images of uh, the black holes. And I put that up on purpose because uh, NSF is proud that we funded this year's Nobel Prize winners in physics. And they won it for uh, mapping the black holes. Well, this didn't happen alone. It didn't happen just by these two NSF funded researchers. It happened through an international team. And that's the way science works is through international collaboration. I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, international collaboration and how it differs very much from the issues that we're talking about here today in research security, but that we are concerned about the many uh, unfortunate activities that are happening that are breaching research security and breaching research integrity and re-emphasize a lot of what Dr. Lauer talked about as well. So next slide, please. So similar to uh, NIH, we're concerned about conflicts of interest and conflicts of commitment, the confidentiality of the merit review process and protection of pre-publication data. Now, NIH and NSF, we fund fundamental research. The whole point of fundamental research is that we want to make sure that it is provided outwards to the community so that other researchers can take those results, replicate them, challenge them, improve upon them. That's the way science works. And um, that system needs to be maintained. 
but we can only maintain the openness of the system if everybody plays by the rules. And that means when researchers are working on their research and they're not ready to make it available as yet, it needs to be protected. And uh, we're seeing cases where there are others who are taking that information, taking proposals, taking information that does not belong to them and claiming that it's theirs and publishing it. And that's not okay. Next slide, please. So uh, Dr. Lauer uh, touched on this, but there are two things that we're worried about here. Conflict of interest is usually defined as financial conflict of interest, where there's a financial relationship that could affect the design and conduct and reporting and funding of research. Then there's conflict of commitment, which is really uh, when you have multiple employers, multiple sources of funding that are significant time commitments. And um, when these commitments themselves could then impact the effort that you're proposing to be funded by a federal agency, that's a conflict of commitment. It involves potential overlap and duplication in funding. It involves things like Dr. Lauer talked about where you might be proposing to NSF or NIH for several months of funding, but you're also being funded for the same number or more months by another entity and not telling us about this and not telling your own employer about this. Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of both of these um, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that. Next slide, please. So um, Mike talked about these foreign talent recruitment programs and how they are very concerning to us. It basically is having a second employer, which is a foreign government. And often, unfortunately, these contracts are not being disclosed to the US institution or to us. Um, and so the problem here is that they disregard intellectual and other property rights, and they do threaten to compromise the transparency and openness and integrity of the scientific system, okay? They are recruiting tools. They often compel those who are part of them to recruit others into the program and hire others to be on their projects rather than through competition, but just because they're part of a talent program themselves. Um, it, they're systematic. Uh, we now know that there are more than 500 of these programs. Most of them are sponsored by either the Chinese national government or Chinese regional governments, uh, and all are connected with the Chinese Communist Party. Next slide, please. So what we're really concerned about here um, is the terms of the contract. And if I could get the next slide, thanks. So um, some more terms in the contracts uh, that Dr. Lauer also mentioned about. These, this is from a real contract. And again, this is from a contract where it is a tenured professor at a US university. And he signed a contract uh, with a, a Chinese government entity to say, that the first author and primary affiliation of the papers that he publishes are going to be the Chinese university. That um, the, this researcher should lead a team and that they need to get at least 10 million RMB or 1.4 million US dollars from sources outside the Chinese university. Okay, and uh, US contracts usually don't specify the exact amount that you need to get from external parts of external sources of funding. You have to develop uh, at least one compound and achieve a number of patents. Um, and, um, and, you know, then there are other terms such as, you know, that you have to hire professors from these other talent programs, okay? So not through competition, but because they're part of these programs, okay? And then it pressures you about the number and quality of papers. You can see why this is something that's concerning to us and should be concerning to the US University as well. Next slide, please. So um, very different from international collaboration. 
right? International collaboration enables research. It strengthens relationships. It leverages resources. It trains a robust S&T workforce. And we want to make sure that students and scholars contribute to the U.S. research enterprise and the enterprise globally. That's collaboration. I am concerned that there might be um, some uh, self-editing going on where we do have researchers who are not entering into international collaborations because they're concerned about getting into trouble. So I do want to emphasize collaboration when it's true collaboration is more than encouraged, um, strongly encouraged. Next slide, please. And um, so again, we want to make sure when we enter into an international collaboration um, that that we ask a series of questions to confirm the collaborative nature of it. And I say this because as an example, there was a very prominent US university where a researcher who had NSF funding, significant NSF funding was approached by a foreign entity who is bringing their own funding and said, I wanna work with you on this project with my own funding and we can leverage these resources together. Well, the researcher in looking into it couldn't really trace the source of that international entity's funding, couldn't find that international entity's bio or anything on the website, and really just didn't know a lot about the, 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 the researcher that was approaching him. So in cases like that, there was such a lack of transparency and a lack of understanding of the funding sources. And so that US researcher chose not to enter into the collaboration. And that's probably a very wise decision. So we do wanna make sure that we do know the, the chains of funding. We wanna make sure of course, that there is true intellectual contribution on both sides in a collaboration, that there's the leveraging of skills and that we do make sure that there's overall benefit. And again, improper foreign government interference is not international collaboration. It's not what we're talking about here. Next slide, please. And so, you know, I, I want to go a little bit more into um, the, the size of collaboration that we have at NSF and again, emphasize that this is not about, in, about the heritage of people. It is not about someone's nationality. You can see here that NSF has robust collaboration with China, that it's our fifth largest uh, partner, actually, uh, if you look at the number of uh, projects. And, um, you know, what we're looking at here when we're looking at improper interference and breaches to security is we're looking at individuals' behaviors. Next slide, please. Next slide. So uh, we want to, of course, make sure that we continue to emphasize collaboration at NSF and that we promote the norms of openness, transparency, and reciprocity. We do need to balance this with the needs of security. We have to protect the federally funded uh, research enterprise. NSF has an $8.3 billion budget. 93% of that budget goes straight out the door to fund research. Even with that, we can only fund about 20% of the proposals that come into us. So when we make funding decisions based on inaccurate or incomplete, false information, it's just not fair. And often it could be illegal. So we need to make sure that we emphasize disclosure and transparency, okay? We are trying to better understand the scale and scope of the issues that we're dealing with here. Dr. Lauer mentioned that, uh, that they found about 200 scientists thus far at NSF. It's a lower number. We do think that there is more, unfortunately, that is out there. So we have put into place a stronger analytics effort to uncover issues so that we can, again, make sure that those who are transparent, who are playing by the rules, benefit from the funding. And those who are not, um, that, that they don't benefit from the funding. Next slide, please. So um, I won't go a lot into this, but we are working very closely across the US government 
with the scientific community. We want to make sure that we better assess the risks. We created my position here. And we're really focusing a lot on disclosure. And I'll talk about some of the terms that we've put into place. Next slide, please. So um, we emphasize disclosure of current and pending research support. NIH does as well. It's about disclosure of other support for NIH. We use this information uh, to assess the capacity of the researcher to carry out the research, as well as any overlap or duplication. Um, and so, of course, if we don't have the information, then we don't know if, uh, if an NSF grant is going to uh, be overlapping with someone else's funding. So we do need to know that information. Complementary funding is okay as long as we know about it. Uh, many researchers get grants from many different sources and that's absolutely fine. We just need to make sure that they do have the capacity to perform the grant and that there isn't too much overlap or duplication with other funding. Okay, and we do need to know this information, whether the financial, the research support is provided directly to the individual or to the organization. And we do need in-kind contributions as well if there is a time commitment involved. If there's no time commitment involved, they do not need to be reported in current and pending support. Next slide, please. So uh, as we have been clarifying and emphasizing the disclosure rules on current and pending, we're finding more and more US institutions coming forward to us with information that probably should have been provided at time of proposal, but they but wasn't for whatever reason. And so we have a new term and condition in place uh, that instructs institutions with what to do with this post-award disclosure information where to submit it. We do require also an assessment of that new information about capacity overlap or duplication issues. We'll take a look at it and we'll determine together with the institution whether it constitutes something that needs to go forward to the inspector general because it might be waste, fraud, or abuse, whether there might be concerning overlap or duplication or not. And if not, that's okay too. We just really appreciate getting the additional information in. Next slide, please. And we have another new term and condition because we have found that many of our large size awardees who are funding for major research facilities are entering into international collaborations themselves. And again, that's fine, that's good, but we do need to be aware of those collaborations prior to them becoming finalized. And so we have a new um, requirement for large facility awardees to let us know about any potential international collaboration so we can review it prior to it, it's going into effect. And as part of this, we also want to know about existing collaborations with non-US organizations that our major facilities may have. We have to look at this for policy considerations as well as to make sure that the awardee continues to have the capacity to perform the terms of the NSF grant. Next slide, please. So next steps, um, Dr. Lauer talked to you about the OSTP group that he and I both co-chair. It's a subcommittee on research security that's part of the Joint Committee on the Research Environment. Um, we're continue to work through, through them. They are working to finalize guidance for uh, federal government agencies as well as for research institutions. These aren't going to be um, formal requirements, but they are going to be uh, best practices and uh, efforts that, uh, that we've seen and that we recommend that everyone follow. We're working diligently on external training for the academic research community. We know that more information is needed out there. What we foresee is developing training modules that we'll post online and uh, that anyone can download and hopefully incorporate into existing training if it does exist. And we wanna make sure that we work closely with you. Something that we have not focused on as much is uh, guidance for NSF reviewers. Again, Dr. Lauer talked about the merit review process and some concerns and breaches that NIH has seen. 
we want to make sure that we mitigate any potential risk to this important system that really guides our research and funding decisions. And so we're going to be talking to you about things that we can put into place without too much administrative burden to preserve the integrity of the review process. And I think that was my last slide. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for that um, uh, comprehensive view and, uh, and the notion uh, of um, uh, both of you have uh, uh, absolutely clearly stated that collaboration is something that is necessary and is important. And it is the, uh, the problematic uh, bad actors that we are trying to keep out of the system and, uh, and, and uh, inform all, all uh, other, other people. Um, I'm seeing some questions. Let me ask the audience questions and I have a few questions of my own. Um, one of the questions is, this is a, a question where if disclosed fully, is it ever, ever appropriate for NIH or NSF funded faculty at US institutions to become affiliated with a foreign talent program of some sorts? Uh, that's the question. Uh, so maybe start with maybe uh, uh, Rebecca and then ask Mike to chime in. Sure. So for us, it is not prohibited. We do want to, of course, make sure that everything is fully disclosed that's part of that contract. So something that we are seeing is that, as Dr. Lauer said, sometimes it's disclosed as an honorary appointment when they're part of this talent recruitment program without the full scope of the time commitment and the funding commitment actually being disclosed. So all parts of the commitment do need to be told to us. At the same time, we strongly recommend that the US institution review the contract because it is their employer, employee that's signing it. Um, and the institution is responsible for resolving any potential conflicts of interest. So at the same time, the, the, we're doing things through a communications chain and a full disclosure chain. Thank you, Rebecca. Mike? I have nothing to add to that. OK. OK. Um, another question is, um, the, the, I know, uh, Rebecca, you mentioned about uh, you're using analytics to discover issues. Um, the, uh, the, the audience, uh, the person in the audience is asking, it, it, just curious about what type of analytics and methods. I'm not sure if we can share that, but uh, they're curious about it. Sure. So, so what we're doing is, again, we want to understand the scale and the scope of the, the size of the problem that we're dealing with here. So as a, a, an initial step, we've been taking NSF funded proposals in a particular program in a particular year and looking at the disclosures um, that were provided in the proposals and then um, mapping those proposals on a web of science and seeing what uh, were those same researchers acknowledging in web of science publications. What we are seeing is that at least 10% of those proposals had uh, public, had institutions that were credited, international institutions that were credited in their acknowledgements in web of science that were not disclosed in their proposals to NSF. Now, we don't know the reasons why uh, and that's why we need to take a deeper dive. We're not going to take undue action unless there is something that's concerning to us. But certainly, we're seeing a pretty broad pattern of non-disclosure here for whatever reason, and it's something we do need to work on. Okay, any thoughts on that, Mike? Yeah, so um, uh, I, I would say that uh, we don't know the extent of the problem. Um, and. Uh, uh, and like uh, Rebecca said, it's almost certainly worse than, than we think it is. And each time we think we, we, we have a handle on it, there's more uh, that, that seems to come in. Um, we've also seen in some of the contracts that it, it's explicitly stated that uh, they are not to disclose what they're doing uh, to any third party, uh, which would, the obvious third party would be the uh, American university uh, who is their primary employer. Um, and so th there's something systematic going on here. It, it is not just that people are, are forgetting um, to uh, mention the contract that they signed in China uh, or the grant that they received in China. There, there, there's, a, there's a systematic effort 
um, to make sure that this information does not become known in a timely way uh, to their uh, American institution uh, or, to, uh, or, to, or to American funding agencies. We've even seen cases where uh, people will disclose uh, their UK award and their French award, but not their Chinese awards. Um, and uh, so that, that goes along with the uh, idea that there's something, uh, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's something systematically deliberate going on behind all this. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, for that uh, answer. The uh, one of the one of the uh, community. Um, my experience uh, with, with the community has been, the, the, especially the Chinese community. Um, majority of them are, are researchers, amazing folks uh, from China. They're just great scientists here. But the moment they want now at this and under this climate, they are uh, disproportionately more worried about their relationship that in, even can I go to a conference in China? I, my name is published. I'm invited to this conference. Can I go? These kinds of questions would never come up. So they are alerted much more than, uh, than anyone else, understandably so. Uh, so in, in, in terms of uh, an institutional uh, response to make sure that this is, although the, the problem has manifested itself uh, in, in the Chinese context, how do we, uh, your advice on how do we make sure that the agencies uh, is focused on the problem, uh, not specific? How, how do we communicate that so that they, they can continue to go about their business? Uh, Mike. Rebecca, please. Oh, you know, I was just going to say um, the, the examples that we showed, I think, are, are very illustrative. Um, when someone travels to China for a conference, um, and again, they disclose that travel and that attendance at the conference to their U.S. institution, not a problem. It really isn't. I think what we're seeing here are patterns of uh, taking sums of money, not disclosing those, commitments uh, to another entity that are not being disclosed for substantive amounts of time. I'll just give you one example. Um, we, we had a researcher who uh, was getting a significant amount of NSF funding. And um, they did say that they wanted to take leave from their NSF project to go to China to take care of their sick parents. And it was for several months. Well, um, some, one of their colleagues saw that they were actually publishing and crediting a Chinese entity during that period of time when they were supposed to be taking leave. And the, uh, the publications were really, really similar in content to what NSF was funding them to do. Something like that is very different, right, from what we're talking about of traveling for a conference. That is a pattern of non-disclosure, taking funding, crediting another entity, not crediting the US entities. Uh, and that's really what we're talking about here. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Now, now there's um, general advice, which uh, I don't, I'm, I don't know whether you're doing this, but many institutions uh, give this advice to their, to their staff. And, and that is whenever you're going on an international trip, um, irrespective of what country you're going to, there are certain things that, that you do. So for example, you take a loaner computer that's completely wiped clean uh, because otherwise in, in certain parts of the world, you could assume that um, whatever's on your computer is going to be taken and it's going to be taken within a relatively short period of time. You got sensitive information, sensitive documents uh, on your computer, it, it's going to be uh, stolen. Um, so, you know, I've taken international trips on behalf of the NIH, I take a loaner computer Basically, all it has is, is a, a web app so that I can, I can email back home and, and that, that's about it. But there are no files on it. And what that would mean is, is that if it were stolen, it wouldn't matter. It's just a, it's just a piece of machinery. Um, a, another a piece of advice, and this gets to what we were talking about before, is never, ever, ever sign a contract unless you know what you're signing. Uh, I mean, this is true if you're buying a house. <laughs> the same thing. Um, and, uh, and so uh, do be careful. Um, being invited to a conference is great, but before too long, you might find yourself, um, some piece of paper is gonna be put in front of you and you may be asked to sign it. And the answer should be, uh, no, no, no. I need to have some people look at this first. And what we're finding is often they're being asked to sign this piece of paper, this contract, and they're being told, but don't worry, it might have these conditions in it, but you don't really have to do that. Well, you're still signing your name to something and you have that obligation. And often that obligation does come to be reality after you sign it. 
Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that is uh, that's right on. Uh, in, in terms of PIs, you know, the, as in, the PIs act as individuals, but the, but the grants come to the institution. So we have an accountability from institution perspective to be responsible to the agencies. Um, and from a PI perspective, you know, their reputation is at stake. Eventually, you know, the, it, 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 uh, if found guilty, it's the PI, but the institution's reputation goes with it. So that's our and our obligation to not being able to deliver. So we are both uh, in it. Um, so in, in, in terms of uh, when PIs sign a contract, of course, they have the option of checking with, we have legal, uh, you know, entire legal team in my office uh, that, uh, that's happy to review contracts. Um, and, but if it's a personal kind, if they're buying a house, you know, would they want to ask me? No, but if they're personally trying to, like uh, the first example you showed Mike, that is they're actually trying to switch over to another institution, clean cut, they don't have to show me the contract. They just sign whatever it is they resign from my office, they're gone. Uh, so this fine line is when uh, I think we have to emphasize to our PIs that when, you, as long as you continue to be uh, employed at the University of Virginia, if you're signing a contract, um, I'm not sure if we can say you're obligated to check with us, but we are, if you don't check with us, the consequences fall squarely on you and you're taking the reputation of the institution with you if you go down. So that's the uh, sort of the, you know, collaborative message that uh, that we have been uh, sending so to 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 uh, get that uh, uh, help them encourage them to uh, help review by experts so the, there are some institutions and uh, the University of California is be is one of them um, but but they're not the only ones there uh, we've seen this in many institutions around the country that explicitly state that if you're going to get employment uh, someplace else uh, while you are employed by the University of California you must get prior approval yeah, absolutely. We have the, we have the same uh, the policy. Uh, absolutely, we do have the policy. But when it comes to a contract signing, whether this is uh, simple enough, uh, like sabbatical, people go on sabbatical all the time, and they have arrangements with institutions, and uh, they publish papers and say, uh, you know, affiliated with the Uni University of Virginia. Then uh, at the time of writing, I uh, this work was done while on sabbatical here. I mean, those are we know that those kinds of uh, things can be done. So the, one of the questions that, uh, uh, that this is leading to is uh, one of the, uh, the here's a question. Uh, do you have recommendations for uh, internal controls that we can put in place to identify situations like these? So we do have conflict of interest disclosure. We have added foreign uh, you know, affiliation uh, uh, component to it. We've added that. And we have, we have the foreign influence uh, site and, we, and we, they're required to disclose, et cetera. We're doing the education uh, side of things. But that's where the question of the intelligence uh, comes in. But we, we are reviewing case by case. We, we're not going to have thousands and thousands. But uh, any suggestions uh, on, uh, you know, what kind of internal controls we could consider based on your experience with other institutions? Thank you. Um, well, one thing that, that we've found is to establish a better connection between the Office of Sponsored Research and the Conflicts Office. Um, often uh, the, the affiliations and uh, sources of income and funding are often disclosed to the conflicts office, but then that information doesn't get into the disclosures because it you know, doesn't get into the Office of Sponsor Research. So that's, that's one aspect that, uh, that I find. Uh, another one is um, I think some benchmarking among universities, and we've thought about this as well, is you know, are there ways that that we can, as a US government, establish some um, information sharing hubs that universities can use. Uh, so there are best practices that University of Florida has put into place. The UT system has put into place great things, all in internal controls to increase compliance. And uh, because it's part of the university workings, you know, again, it's not requirements that we're putting into place, but it's been working incredibly well as evidenced by the increased number of disclosures that are coming into us, the funding agencies. So I think that sharing of information is extremely important. Now, some of it depends on comfort level. Some universities are going into the realm of, you know, flagging things in emails, uh, that might be concerning. Other institutions might not feel comfortable with that approach. So I think it does depend somewhat on the structure and the system, but certainly there are some best practices out there. Mike, what do you think? Uh, some institutions um, have uh, put systems into place to see whether or not uh, large amounts of data or sensitive documents um, are, are leaving. Uh, and so uh, 
for example, um, I think it's at the University of Texas, they have, um, they have a system in place because they've, they have found that sometimes there are these uh, massive data extractions that are occurring in the middle of the night. And data is leaving the University of Texas that should not be leaving the University of Texas and, and is being sent off to, uh, to China and, and possibly to, um, to elsewhere. Uh, one, another thing that they have done, uh, which may sound extreme, but actually kind of makes a lot of sense, um, is that uh, they have disabled all the USB ports um, so that uh, if, if you want to either bring data into your machine or move data out of your machine, it, it's all through the network, uh, which means it's all traceable. Um, and uh, and uh, it also, it, it's a great security mechanism because flash drives are a great source of malware and ransomware and, and uh, viruses and so forth. So you um, avoid all that. Uh, but it, it also sends a, a message to, uh, um, to students, to uh, junior scientists and to faculty that everything you're working with at the university, everything you're working with at the University of Virginia belongs to the University of Virginia. It does not belong to you. It belongs to the University of Virginia and you should treat it with, with that kind of, uh, of respect. Uh, and uh, if you're planning to, um, to move things from one place to another, whether it be specimens, data, documents, uh, remember, this is really somebody else's property, uh, and you want to make sure that uh, that the person who actually owns the property or the institution that owns the property um, is uh, is okay with what you're doing. I did want to mention one other thing that 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 we've been thinking through. In in many labs, of course, there's a power relationship going on. You have an incredibly highly respected, uh, tenured professor who's running a lab, and um, not in every case, but in many cases, and we did see this in the Harvard case, there are others in the lab, postdocs and graduate students and others who might see some, some questionable, be, questionable behavior going on here. And they're told, you know, don't worry about, you know, that, that I'm, I'm signing uh, Harvard's name on this agreement, you know, don't worry about it, you know, don't tell anybody, I'll take care of it. Uh, and so I think uh, a best practice that we're considering recommending is having some type of ombuds program where if you see something that's concerning um, and you don't feel comfortable, similar to sexual harassment types of issues, it would be a person to be able to go to check. Do you think this is OK? You think this is not OK? What should I do? That, that's, that's an excellent point. In fact, at the University of Virginia, we have, you know, we have a research misconduct hotline that we had existed for a long time. And we have added this, uh, you know, you could uh, talk about if you're concerned about any of these that you hear about, you can just call in. This is a third party managed, so nobody would know who called in. So we do have that's that. Great. It's on our website. Um, and yeah, so that's that's an excellent point. Uh, but the ombudsman idea is individuals. I mean, early on, uh, Mike, when, when this, uh, uh, the first time I heard you talk about this issue and the institutions were thinking about it, there were PIs asking about, I had no idea this was wrong. You know, can, if I disclose it, will I get into trouble that, well, I had this appointment, I don't have it anymore. Uh, you know, that type of question uh, came up. So I know that now, uh, Rebecca, you talked about the you know, post-award basis, but then if there's some event that happened, they exited out of that, would it be wise for PIs to just go ahead and disclose it anyway in, in the interest of transparency? Just put it out there, send it to us. That's what we are saying, but I want to be sure that uh, both of you, what do you think? Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, if you're not sure and it's something maybe you, 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 you didn't know you had to disclose or you didn't feel comfortable disclosing or whatever reason, certainly do bring it forward to your institution. And um, we have this new term and condition, uh, but, you know, to, to instruct people with what to do with it. And it should come through the institution. I should say that as well. Because something else that we are finding is that PIs themselves are often te now telling their program officers, oh, by the way, you know, I didn't report this particular source of funding. I want to tell you now. And unless it goes from the institution into the system for, for evaluation, it's hard to, you know, to make sure that we're systematic and that we take care of covering that information. So it should go through the proper process. We, we had a really interesting case where um, this was uh, somebody who signed a Thousand Talents contract many years ago. Um, and then uh, a few years after he had done this and uh, he didn't tell anybody and he was spending a few months a year in China, uh, also saying that he was attending to a family, but in fact, he was working at this institution. 
he um, got this uh, form from his university and they, they had added a question, which was, do you have any affiliations with foreign institutions? Th this was long before all of this excitement came up over the last few years. And so he came clean. He said, yeah, actually I do. Um, and uh, then they asked and he showed them a copy of the contract that he had signed and they got all excited and they said, there's absolutely no way you can do this. This is completely unacceptable. But um, if you would like, we can, we can engage in a negotiation with this university in China to set up some kind of a collaboration. And so that's what they did. And uh, they signed a, a, a very specific MOU between the two institutions about the projects that were going to be carried out. And they spelled out, you know, this person will do this and this person will do that. And this is how IP will be handled. And this is how data will be handled. And, and they did that for two or three years and they completed some projects and everybody lived happily ever after. So uh, th this was a, a, a nice case and, and we shared this with OSDP um, of where, because the institution asked a very explicit question and the scientists did come forward, um, they were able to take a bad situation um, and actually turn it into a good one. Well, that's a great story. <laughs> that's a great story. One last, uh, hopefully there's a very quick one. Uh, uh, could you discuss the importance of disclosing uh, in grant applications in-kind support from external entities? So uh, for, for NSF, uh, you need to disclose in-kind support from external entities in, in two places. And there's a reason why. If it is in-kind support with a time commitment, so they're, they're giving you something in an exchange, you're going to perform some type of research for them, or there's a time commitment, then you do need to report that in your current and pending support. If there's no time commitment, but you're getting that in-kind support and you're gonna be using it on the proposed project, um, then we need to know about it in facilities and other equipment because we have to determine for the budget, you know, if you have this, this piece of equipment that you're gonna be using that, you know, again, we don't want that to be part of the NSF funding to you. Yeah. Well, well, our hour and 15 minutes has vaporized uh, with uh, plenty to gain uh, and uh, excellent uh, discussion and guidance. I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Mike Lauer and Dr. Rebecca Kayser for taking the time to come to the University of Virginia and uh, speak to us uh, directly. It's been immensely helpful. I'm sure I'll hear more questions uh, and, uh, and thoughts, and uh, we will uh, uh, continue to do our part. Like I said in the beginning, we are all in this together. As institutions, we are committed to do what it takes to uh, for for uh, the integrity of the U.S. research enterprise and that plays into national security and competitiveness. We are in it together. You can have count our word on it. And thank you very much for your uh, presence here. Thank you, Ram. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. And you too. Bye thank now. You. Bye bye. bye, -bye.